Okay, the main subject is we'll get to here is reincarnation. I'll talk just a little bit about it before we take you back. <clears throat> I uh, believed in reincarnation naturally, pretty much. Uh, well, I didn't know what to believe when I was young. My parents didn't take me to church or anything. They, my dad was a notorious drinker, and he wasn't very religious at all. Um, my parents were baptized in the Mormon church. And about once a year to uh, maybe Easter or something, my mom would haul me off to church. And I would spill a sacrament or something because I was didn't know what was going on. Didn't like it. <laughs> and I usually embarrassed her, so she only went when she absolutely had to. And uh, I didn't think much about religion, except I remember when I was a little kid thinking, boy, you know, I remember I was about five or six years old, and I thought, you know, five or six years ago, I wasn't even here. I thought, where in the world was I? <laughs> and I used to think about that a lot from the time I can remember. I thought, that's really odd, you know, that I can't remember where I was five or six years ago. And then when I was about 12, our neighbor got a, a book uh, called uh, about Bridie Murphy. Has everyone heard of that? And... Uh, she was talking about it with my mom and talking about past lives, and I thought, that's it. I says, that makes sense to me. And it really struck a chord. And from that moment on, I believed in reincarnation. The bishop hauled me in one more time, and he says, I heard you believe in reincarnation. I says, well, yeah. He said, well, let me read you a scripture. It is given unto man once to die, and after this a judgment. And I read it, and I thought, hmm, does seem to say that, doesn't it? He said, yeah, there's, no, there's only one life. Okay. He says, I heard you also drink and smoke. <laughs> I says, well, sometimes. <laughs> I was only 12. <laughs> He says, you're not supposed to drink and smoke. I says, really? I didn't know that. <laughs> so he says, well, he, said, he committed me to not drink and smoke anymore. I said, well, I guess I won't then. So I was a pretty good guy for quite some time. I obeyed all the rules. And then I learned um, my uh, uh, brother-in-law come by one time and he was interested in a bunch of oddball stuff, and he left this book on hypnosis. And you couldn't even get a book on hypnosis in the, those days. That was about 1958 or something like that. And now hypnosis is really, you, everybody can find out about it. But then you can then you go to a bookstore, there's no books on it, nothing on it. But he happened to get this, this book uh, by a stage hypnotist. And I read all the way through it, and... Then at the end, I finally told, at the very end, how to hypnotize somebody. And so I studied it over carefully. And I thought, well, this is going to be fun. So I experimented with a couple of my friends, and it seemed to work. And, and then I started doing it at school. And I was about 16 at the time. I started doing it at school and at church. After church, I'd take people into a, a, a room that was... A, a room that nobody was in, <laughs> hypnotize them. <laughs> and same thing at school. At school, during the lunch hour, I'd take people out on the lawn and hypnotize somebody and have them do crazy stuff. <laughs> and uh, So I, then I got it from two different sides. The bishop calls me in again and says, you know, you're not supposed to be hypnotizing people. I said, well, does it say anything in the Bible about that? He says, well, no. I said, well, I just keep doing it then. <laughs> and he didn't really have a good answer for me. He said, well, you be careful. That could be dangerous. And same thing in, in high school. My teachers all pointed me out right in the middle of class saying, you should not be empathizing people. I said, well, why not? Is it illegal? Well, I don't, I don't think so. Is any against school rules? Well, I don't know. you know, they didn't have anything school rules about. 
I said, well, I just guess I'll keep doing it then. <laughs> so I had a couple of teachers that was really negative on me, but, you know, there was no rule against it and no law against it, so... But hypnosis kind of led me to discover um, past lives. And the first time that really got me going was Wayne and I was double dating. That's Wayne right over there. Wayne from the book. And um, we're kind of the break monotony. We decided we told uh, Wayne tells the gals, you know, my friend here is a hypnotist. Well, you want to be hypnotized? The gal says, yeah. Okay, well, she was a pretty good subject, so I thought, well, let's, you know, I had taken several people back to the day that they were born, and this is kind of interesting to have them relive the day that they were born. Some people say that they don't really, can't see hardly at all at the first couple of days, takes their eyes a while to adjust. Uh, one thing almost everybody says is that they really feel their mother's love. They, the, they really sense that. And, um, um, but, so I took her back the day she was born, and she was a pretty good subject. And as a Mormon, I, we believed in a pre-existence, but not reincarnation, that the Mormons believe there's only one life, but you did live before you were born in heavenly spheres. <clears throat> so I thought, well, wonder what had happened if I took her back before she was born, just what, what uh, she would say, if, if it's possible. So I told her to go back before she was born, and then she began speaking with an English accent and give her name, and she lived in uh, uh, northern England. Now, what was interesting about this, as a, as a Mormon, I went on a mission to northern England, exactly, and I, w I was in England at the spot where she said she lived in a past life. Now, what's interesting about England is the accent is different in different parts of the country. You know, you know how the accent is different with a southerner here or somebody from Texas or Louisiana or Boston? It's the same thing in England. The southern English accent is a lot different than the northern, just like it is here. All we hear <clears throat> is the James Bond type accent or the, what they call the Queen's English. But... Um, the northern British accent, they speak a lot faster, and it's a lot harder to understand. <clears throat> but anyway, she was, in her past life, she lived in northern England, and I had spent two years in northern England. So I knew the accent well. But what really got my motor going is she went back, and she spoke with a perfect, not southern British accent, but northern British accent that hardly anybody here would even know what that is. And I, I thought... Wow, she speaks with a perfect northern British accent. This is amazing. And that was the first scientific evidence I got that made me really doubt the one life idea, you know. And then I uh, got this girlfriend that lived in uh, Portland and went over there to chase her a short time later. And we were having a party after church. And it was um, at somebody's house. And the, me and my girlfriend went to attend that. And it was kind of boring there. So I told everybody, you know, I'm a hypnotist. I can take people back to the day they were born if somebody wants to go back. Oh, really? You know, everybody doubted that could happen. And so they says, um, the owner of the house, which was a lady, they said, um, put her in a chair and they said, take her back. Now, her husband, on about this time I was to take her back, he had to go get some potato chips and dip and stuff. So he, he took off to the store. So he was gone. And so I started, um, I took her back to the day she was born. And then I, this was only the second time I did this. I thought, well, let's try going to the previous life again, see if anything materializes again. So I took her back, I told her to go back before she was born, and she went back to the days of the Roman Empire, and she said she was married to a Roman senator named Marcus Aurelius, not the emperor, but another guy named Marcus Aurelius who was in the Roman Senate. And uh, 
Another interesting fact about that life is he was killed in battle. And then I took her back to another life in which she went back to the days of like uh, prehistoric days where they lived in kind of primitive times and there was different types of animals and things than there are today. And she described it. <clears throat> and then her husband comes back and I took her back to the present and everybody says, take him back. He says, what, what, back where? You know, he didn't know what was going on. So we sat him down, and I went through the same th the procedure with him and took him back, and I says, and what is your name? He says, Marcus Aurelius. <laughs> and you should have seen everybody, because they were all Mormons, and none of them were supposed to believe in reincarnation. And everybody goes, ooh. <laughs> and so I quizzed him, and I says, how did you die? He says, I was killed in battle. You know, give the same story she gave. I took him back, farther back, and he went back to a prehistoric time. And he, I says, um, was, you, was your current wife your spouse in the prehistoric times? He says, yeah, you know, we didn't have official marriage back then, but she was like my partner. And I asked him, I says, when you met in this life, did you seem familiar to each other? They says, yeah. She says, we uh, he proposed in about a week after we met. You know, we knew we knew immediately we were supposed to be together. So we discovered two lifetimes they had together, and that explained why they immediately recognized each other in this life. Now, being good Mormons, they thought it was from the heavenly spheres they knew each other. You know, but by taking them back, it was <clears throat> uh, reincarnation. Now, the interesting thing was it shook up a lot of people there. And people came to me and said, well, this shakes my testimony, one person says to me. And I thought, well, I don't want to destroy anybody's faith. Or I said, well, this could be like a gene genetic memory. Maybe we pass through memory in the cells of our ancestors or something like that. So there's a number of explanations for it. And even though I had seen all this proof myself, I still didn't believe it 100%. I didn't believe it 100% until I had several other things happen. And finally, when I discovered um, one of my own past lives, and then I was able to um, prove another past life with handwriting analysis. By studying the handwriting of one life with another, Sometimes it will be very close. Intelligence will always be the same, but sometimes it will be very close if the person hasn't changed a lot. Now, when I proved it with handwriting analysis, because there's no two handwritings the same, just like there's no two fingerprints. It's like finding two fingerprints almost. When I found two handwriting samples that matched almost identically and had a couple little quirky things in that's maybe in one out of a thousand handwritings, but when you add several of them together, it would make the probability of them being this close, you know, one in millions. I stepped back and I thought, you know, I've been seeing this evidence and been rationalizing. Now I have to take a second look. I have to look at it like with fresh eyes. I've been looking at it through what the church has told me to look at. Now i got to look at it as if there is no church and I decided to take all the scriptures and read them as if I didn't know anything. And when I did this, I found hundreds of evidences in the scriptures, both the Mormon scriptures and the Bible, <clears throat> that there is reincarnation. And it's amazing how many there were. The early church, some of the early church fathers were against reincarnation. And when the first Bibles were put together, uh, there was a lot of editing where they took the obvious stuff out, but they couldn't get everything out because the subtle things proving reincarnation um, uh, they missed. Like with John the Baptist, for instance, there's a prophecy that Elijah was supposed to come again be uh, and precede the Messiah. Well, the disciples came to Jesus and says, well, if you're the Messiah... Where's Elijah? And Jesus said point blank, Elijah did come again. And he came again in the person of John the Baptist. John the Baptist is Elijah. 
so John the Baptist did precede the Messiah, so the prophecy was fulfilled. So he's that's almost point blank in the Bible. The when you give this to a religious person, the only counter he will hit you with was somebody came to John the Baptist and asked him if he was Elijah, and he says, "No, I'm just a voice of one crying in the wilderness." The several reasons why John the Baptist said no, but Jesus said yes. One, Jesus saw with a higher vision than John the Baptist. It's quite possible John the Baptist didn't know he was Elijah. He, he, maybe he just didn't remember. Secondly, if he would have said he was Elijah, he probably would have been killed prematurely. So he, he wanted to avoid giving an answer like that. Just like Jesus got killed for letting, uh, not denying he was the Messiah. So <clears throat> John had a really good reason to avoid answering that question directly. He just said, no, I'm just a one cry, a voice crying in the wilderness. So anyway, I, I read it through and um, I read all the scriptures through and I found evidence after evidence. And from that point on, I changed my course of study entirely and start. I've always been interested in oddball things. Like I said, I studied hypnosis when I was 16 and supposedly a good Mormon. And uh, But then I started studying a lot of other interesting things that uh, were far outside the realm of the church. One, one of the things that caught my attention the most were the writings of Alice A. Bailey, I think are the deepest writings upon the planet. They contain tremendous uh, uh, depth to their teaching. And many of the things that are taught by, all, by many of the gurus, that we see around us uh, got their information from Alice Bailey uh, writings. If you screw up a lifetime, then you come back and repeat a similar situation where you succeed this time. Like if you commit suicide because you're depressed, because you're not succeeding or something, well, you come back, you get in this similar situation, and then when you're thinking of committing suicide, you'll get maybe a little deja vu. You think, well, I feel like this wouldn't work. Because <laughs> you, know? Cause you already did it, and now you're right back there again, you know. <clears throat> and so this time maybe you don't commit suicide, or maybe you do it two lifetimes in a row, but you keep coming back until finally you learn your lesson and you do it right. Now, most lifetimes we go through, we have some improvement. We learn some lessons. may not seem that way sometimes, but we learn more than we think we learn a lot of times. And then some lifetimes we do legitimately screw up. And this is the same thing with an age. Some, most ages we learn something and we go on, go on, the next age is better. Then once in a while humanity will just screw up an age and become ripe for destruction. Civilization, as we... as was known at the time has been destroyed quite a few times on this planet. And um, so hopefully, <clears throat> if we, we do have the power to destroy ourselves like we've never done before. And hopefully we don't, uh, we don't do it, that we are smart enough to work through the problems that we have and develop peace on earth, goodwill to man, so to speak. Thanks for listening to the New Age Christian Synthesis Podcast. If what you heard rang true for you, and you want to find out more, please visit J.J. Dewey's website at freeread.com. <laughs>